so I got a very long title to my talk here, but uh, it boils down to something I like to call the pentad, and that is, of course, the connection of uh, dysautonomia, mast cell activation syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, uh, GI dysmotility, and autoimmunity. And so uh, when I uh, see patients walking into my clinic, uh, that's usually what I recognize right away when I'm, you know, even before getting very deep into their history is that they have these five entities in some quantity uh, going on with them. Let's see. So I tailored this talk to uh, talk about mainly how the five entities kind of interlace again and again and again with each other and play off each other. And as part of uh, that discussion, uh, I thought it'd be a good idea to introduce this idea of the pentad, what I call a pentad super syndrome, because all these other five entities are full syndromes in themselves. And so the pentad is, of course, a super syndrome. And uh, of course, Dr. Chopra really wants me to talk about uh, dysautonomia, focus on that. And so it, it also gives me the opportunity to talk a little bit about what I call the embryology or the natural history of dysautonomia. And again, since they all play off each other, we're really talking about the, the natural history of the full pentad. And within that natural history, again, talking about this interlacing of the five entities, uh, I want to talk about uh, at least theoretical connections. Uh, and there's probably more than just the, the four I've outlined here, but I think these four are really um, uh, important. And uh, that is, we'll talk about the unstable craniocervical region, uh, and then the idea of this brain-gut axis, what I call a vortex, it's more than just a cycle, but a vortex, uh, mast cell activation itself, and then finally this uh, idea that the methylation folate pathway may be involved in this uh, uh, ongoing connection between the five entities. All right, so when a patient walks in to the clinic, and starts discussing their symptoms. It's not long before they're, they're talking about at least 15 different symptoms. I usually ask them to kind of stop at 15 uh, because that's enough to work with. But, but definitely I want to hear about them all because you're putting together all the different patterns of their uh, complaints and realizing uh, you know, what is underlying uh, to explain that. And it's, it's not long before you realize that you can kind of pick apart which symptoms belong to which syndromes. And so uh, if you highlight these, uh, you can see some of the symptoms uh, really uh, are explained best by the dysautonomia they have. Some are explained best by the mast cell activation and some are explained by Ehlers-Danlos. Uh, and yet others are even explained by the autoimmunity that they may have underlying. And then, of course, uh, as we'll talk about, the GI dysmotility is really a combination of the other four. And then you kind of, you know, start picking them apart further, these symptoms, and realizing that uh, they've got a lot of sub-syndromes going on. And it really begins to look like chaos. And uh, so it, it really makes it very, very difficult to focus on how to go about um, uh, picking apart uh, what they have going on and making it into some sort of rational, reasonable uh, treatment plan. But I think uh, as, as chaotic and uh, uh, as chaotic as all that is, I think that you, there's a way to bring some order to it and that is with this idea of the pentad super syndrome, that most of these patient syndrome, uh, sub-syndromes can be explained by these five major things going on. And uh, I'm supposed to talk about mainly, I'll focus mainly on the dysautonomia portion, um, but these, these five different things are really playing off each other again and again. And dysautonomia, mast cell activation syndrome, Ehlers-Danlos, autoimmunity, and then, uh, as I said, gastrointestinal dysmotility is really a combination of the other four. And from that, you can kind of see how, I don't, I don't have a pointer here, do I? 
Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, the mice. Okay. Um, so, um, really, when you start to th think of it as this pentad super syndrome, then all these other um, sub syndromes can be put out there in a way that starts to make sense. Like if a patient is not showing a whole lot of Ehlers-Danlos, then you wouldn't really be thinking of all these subsyndromes over here. And if they're not showing a whole lot of mast cell activation as part of their bigger issue, then you wouldn't be really seeing a lot of these symptoms over, uh, subsyndromes over here. And same with dysautonomia, a lot of these things over here are not happening uh, in, a, in the context of a patient who doesn't have a whole lot of dysautonomia. And finally, autoimmune, you wouldn't be thinking of these things over here too much if they're not showing a whole lot of autoimmunity. So it starts to really put order to the uh, chaos by thinking this way. All right. So how are these five uh, syndromes uh, connected? And this, I like this diagram here, uh, this image here, because it shows that they're connected again and again and play off each other again and again. And that's what we really find. And I think there's major, four major ways that they're connected again and again. The first is what, the, what uh, I call the craniocervical eagle space uh, area, and we'll talk about that in detail. The next is the brain gut axis vortex. After that, we'll talk about how mast cell activation itself uh, can uh, cause all of these issues to uh, uh, appear. And then finally, we'll talk a little bit about the methylation folate pathway uh, being involved. All right. And as, as we do that, we're going to talk about what I call the embryology of the pentad. And uh, uh, I like to think of myself being a pediatrician as the embryologist of the pentad. Uh, I get to see these patients pretty early on when they're just having a few symptoms. And then as I'm caring for them, I see how this just kind of explodes over time to start to include more and more things. And uh, now as a cardiologist, I end up seeing in the early on when I was doing this, I ended up seeing what I call the uh, primary dysfunction of the vagus nerve as the very early issue. Now that patients are coming from far and wide and coming for, with a lot of different histories, uh, I start to see, okay, not everybody starts with a pure vagal dysfunction. And that there are those who already come in with uh, a lot of Ehlers-Danlos type findings before the other four entities appear or those that come in where their very, very first uh, entity, the very, very first symptoms were a primary GI derangement before dysautonomia or Ehlers-Danlos. And yet there's those who came in with mast cell activation as the very first entity. Uh, so I've learned that there's a lot of different uh, uh, pathways, but everybody kind of ends up circling the same drain in the end. But I do want to focus on this idea of, you know, being, a, being that I see a lot of patients that start off with a primary vagal dysfunction to begin with. And I want to talk about what this, this particular pathway is that ends up at that same drain in the end. And so I see these uh, clinical phases that patients go through. And you might use uh, the idea of a patient who starts off perfectly healthy and then they get uh, something like a concussion because that's a patient that was perfectly healthy one minute and then had a concussion and then developed something uh, that changed their life thereafter and uh, so they've somehow injured their vagus nerve as a, as a consequence of that concussion and so they start off with this first phase this uh, vagal dysfunction phase and they may just have palpitations, orthostatic intolerance, and head symptoms like migraine headaches, and dizziness upon standing, and fainting, uh, um, things like that. But no, none of these other symptoms that we talk about that, that fill the first slide that you saw. Okay. Uh, then they go on to something called a uh, renal uh, hypovolemia phase, phase two. And I'll talk about all these phases in detail, but I'm just gonna quickly go through them here on this slide. Uh, and then after 
a few months, they go into this phase three, this metabolic dysfunction phase, and that's kind of where uh, everything starts to fall apart for them. And so they'll start to show signs of some mitochondrial dysfunction. They'll start to show uh, increased uh, hypermobility. They'll start to show signs of mast cell activation, and they'll st sign, start to show signs of uh, GI dysfunction with uh, leaky gut. And then they'll also start to show uh, um, neuropsychiatric changes. Oftentimes anxiety is the biggest one, depression, but, but there are even others that show. And then after a while, uh, other things start to show up. And what I call that it is the autoimmunity and structural changes. So not only uh, are mast cells involved, uh, but now eventually the B cells get involved and they start secreting antibodies. And uh, antibodies can cross-react with parts of the body and you get uh, signs of autoimmunity developing. And they also get the structural changes. And uh, the structural changes include a lot of things. I have a little image here of the Chiari and a little image here of the, the uh, uh, median articulate ligament causing mals, as uh, Dr. Chopra pointed out. But there's a lot of other things that uh, are involved with the structural changes, as you'll see. Okay. So that idea of the, the uh, clinical course, the, the phases, also plays out in kind of the natural course that I see with these patients. And so I have this uh, diagram here that shows young people here from essentially the day they're born going across into their 30s. I could go further beyond that, but I think this is the, the, the key time here in the embryology. And that is all young people are marching toward this wall of dysautonomia. Now I have this, what's called grades, grades zero, one, two, three, and four. And I have plenty of slides to talk about that, but I'll just quickly s state here. Uh, grade zero dysautonomia is what I would say is absolutely no symptoms at all. Grade one dysautonomia is the dysautonomia that almost all young people get. That's uh, you know head rushes upon standing, that's uh, increased fatigue with normal activity. Uh, so uh, it's, it's a very, very common thing to have grade one dysautonomia. Grade three dysautonomia, that's uh, where it's multiple organ systems evolved on a, on a daily basis, uh, and it's interfering with school or work, uh, sports, and social life. So it's grade three dysautonomia is pretty dis debilitating. Grade four up here is where it's so debilitating that it involves instrumentation pick lines, ports, G-tubes, NJ-tubes, uh, wheelchairs, being bedbound. And then grade two dysautonomia is kind of this gray area between just being a normal healthy person and having uh, a, something affect you on a daily basis. Okay, so all young people are just marching toward this wall of dysautonomia. And usually it hits around nine, 10 years of age where they start to have all these symptoms. Um, it just so happens that girls gravitate toward the higher end and boys gravitate toward the lower end. So, and that's probably effective estrogen. So estrogen, which is a powerful vasodilator and it comes in cycles on a monthly basis. Uh, affects girls more so, such that they tend to have, you know, more grade two and three dysautonomia while boys tend to do pretty well. Um, and finally, these little zebras, as you know, are the Ehlers-Danlos uh, hypermobile people, and they tend to be gravitating far up here. So there's this tendency for them to go into grade one, grade two, grade three dysautonomia, and then they start to show a lot of signs of mast cell activation syndrome. And if they uh, go on here, that it, it uh, may take some time, but they start to show evidence of increasing hypermobility. And finally, autoimmunity tends to show up later on. Now, as I said, this isn't everybody. There's a lot of ways to enter this. And some people will have a lot of hypermobility way back here and they'll enter in, uh, and, and, but eventually over here, this is the drain I'm talking about over here where everybody ends up circling the same drain in essence. Okay, so 
I'm going to talk about a little bit more detail, the, the pure vagal dysfunction phase. And that is involving, you know, strictly the autonomic nervous system. And of course, you got the parasympathetic and the sympathetic. And we usually think of the parasympathetic as being dysfunctional. And we usually think of the main nerve, the vagus nerve, being dysfunctional here. And, uh, and the sympathetic is usually involved in such a way that it tries to compensate for the lack of uh, activity of the parasympathetic. So the sympathetic is usually involved by being on overdrive. And that's where, as Dr. Chopra had pointed out, a lot of patients feel high anxiety. Sympathetic nervous system works by being, uh, by releasing adrenaline. And so adrenaline is being excreted, trying to compensate for things like the blood pressure being on the low side and cardiac output being on the low side. So it tries beefing up blood pressure by secreting a lot of adrenaline. And what that does is it causes a patient to feel anxious, it causes uh, palpitations, and it causes insomnia. Okay. Well, the parasympathetics uh, being uh, dysfunctional, one of the very basic things that happens in dysautonomia is a change in the blood flow distribution. And the blood flow uh, distribution is affected much more by gravity. So in a lying position, you're, the distribution of blood flow is pretty good. Sitting up, it starts to become a little tenuous. And standing up, gravity pulls blood flow downward. And you struggle to get uh, blood flow to the upper part of your head. And also, you tend to pool blood in the lower half of the body. So those are, explain a lot of the symptoms we see uh, with uh, dysautonomia. It's very basic uh, stuff. Looking at this a little bit more in more detail, what's happening with blood pooling is really what's happening on the venous side, not the arterial side. The venous side, blood is pooling down in the lower half of the body here, and it actually struggles to fill the heart, and particularly in upright position. And so there's actually a problem with preload. Well, the heart needs preload in order to have a, a full ventricle, which when contracts gives you what's called stroke volume. And stroke volume times heart rate is your cardiac output. So if your preload's not there, your stroke volume's gonna drop. And if your stroke volume drops, then your entire cardiac output drops. And of course, in an upright position, that becomes a problem. Typical adult uh, cardiac output is five liters per minute. In a standing position, it'll drop maybe to three liters per minute. And the part that suffers the most is the part highest uh, against gravity, the, the upper part. Uh, lower part of the body still feels okay. And in, in fact, pooling occurs. Okay. Uh, back to uh, how the vagus nerve might get uh, injured. Uh, I've broken this up into one, two, three, four major places that the, the vagus nerve can become injured. Uh, brainstem or panis compression. Again, if you were thinking of the uh, patient with concussion, you can see that uh, that injury is going to occur up high. But in an Ehlers-Danlos patient, of course, that can occur as the vagus nerve uh, leaves its uh, side in the brainstem and travels uh, on, uh, between the brainstem and the panis before it leaves the cranium. And so that can become compressed because of a, a sagging brain. And we'll talk about that a little bit later. But it all can, so can become compressed because of that Chiari malformation uh, Dr. Chopra mentioned. It can compress it right underneath the uh, brainstem itself before it even leaves the cranium. The next is this pseudo eagle uh, syndrome compression, and I'll go into details to explain what I mean by that. Then finally, there's the nerve body or axonal uh, inflammation itself uh, that can occur. We'll talk about that. And finally, the enteric afferent inflammation. Afferent are the, are the nerves that are heading from the gut back to the brain, so they can become inflamed. And finally, just to point out that not everything about dysautonomia is the vagus nerve. You can also get things like carotid body compression in the, uh, in the neck region. So it's not just about the vagus nerve. Let's pick this apart a little bit more. Uh, 
Uh, I like to break the vagal nerve injury in, up into what I call the top-down approach, the direct toxin or inflammation approach, and then what's called the bottom-up approach. And within the top-down approach, we're talking about, uh, again, again, injuries up high uh, to the vagus nerve. And, and, and this is where, again, something like a uh, concussion would uh, lead to a top-down injury. But you can also have uh, injury at the site uh, where, the, where the vagus nerve leaves the, the cranium in the uh, cervical region of the neck. Uh, so there's a lot of places up high where that can become injured. Then there's the uh, direct toxin uh, inflammation uh, injury to the nerve body or to the uh, axon itself. And that can be uh, caused by uh, viruses, it can be caused by uh, other uh, infectious agents, it can be caused by toxins. Uh, so there's a lot of things that can, that can cause that. And then finally, there's a bottom up approach where it's basically some things happening in the gut that are causing inflammation of the afferent vagus nerve, making it uh, inflamed and dysfunctional that way. So obviously there's a lot of different ways the vagus nerve can become injured. Not all of those are related to Ehlers-Danlos, but there's a lot of uh, ways within this that uh, the injury is almost unique to Ehlers-Danlos patients. Uh, and, uh, even those uh, injuries that are not unique to Ehlers-Danlos patients, I think Ehlers-Danlos patients are more prone to. For instance, the concussion injury, uh, it's certainly not unique to Ehlers-Danlos, but if you have loss of proprioception, uh, considered clumsy, then uh, you're more prone to injury from concussion. And in fact, um, a lot of my patients I, I have a cardiology practice that's in the middle of a town that's huge in sports. And so I see a lot of patients come in with just pure concussion that led to their, to their uh, dysautonomia. But with working with a lot of these patients, uh, I begin to realize, you know, there's underlying Ehlers-Danlos that led to them having a concussion that became uh, major in their life. Like, a soccer butt to the head, a soccer ball butt to the head. Why would that cause a major concussion uh, type of uh, sequence in, in a regular healthy athletic patient? Well, you know, it became apparent that this patient had underlying uh, connective tissue issue and they had a much more significant injury to their head because their brain wasn't as protected uh, being hit, hit in the head with a soccer ball. So that was kind of a big revelation is that, you know, that some of these patients that have minor, minor concussive type uh, trauma can end up with a major problem uh, simply because they didn't have the protection that, uh, that other people do have. All right, so moving down from inside the cranium, we can start to look at this craniocervical, what I call pseudo-eagle uh, instability. So I'm just gonna go through some quick anatomy here. The vagus nerve uh, leaves the cranium and goes through what's called the jugular foramen. And it leaves the cranium along with two other really important nerves. One is the glossopharyngeal nerve and the other is the uh, spinal accessory nerve, the accessory nerve. You can see the, the foramen here that all three of those nerves have to fit through. And you can see a, a picture here. This is the brain stem back here. This is looking from the back uh, of the body toward the, uh, the front. And this is the, the foramen here. And you can see the vagus nerve passing through along with these two other nerves, the glossopharyngeal and the spinal accessory. And there's a little bit more detail here these three uh, nerves leaving here. And uh, uh, these three nerves uh, uh, passing through this space together really explain a lot about a lot of these symptoms that we see in patients. For instance, the glossopharyngeal nerve, cranial nerve number nine, gives rise to what's called the tympanic branch, uh, the tympanic nerve. And that goes up and feeds the tympanic, uh, I'm sorry. How much time do I have? 10 minutes to go. <laughs> I got to speed this up. <laughs> 
there's just a lot to talk about. So that, that f feeds the, uh, the tympanic membrane and injury of this area right here can explain a lot of things, including with the temp injury of the tympanic uh, nerve, you get uh, hyperacusis, you got phonophobia, you've got uh, vertigo, you've got uh, inner ear pain. Uh, so that's, that can be explained a lot by that. Then the glossopharyngeal itself, the glossopharyngeal innervates the, it's a, it's a sensory nerve that innervates the musculature right in the front of the throat. And so a lot of these patients end up having the feeling of a globus, a mass in the back of their throat, or this very, very intense pain in the front of their throat that hurts more by turning your neck. And if you uh, listen to that story, you realize that really fits something called uh, Eagle syndrome. And Eagle syndrome uh, is where uh, any you know, non ehlers danlos patient could have this. It's where this thing called the styloid process is extra long and it can impinge on these same structures here, including the glossopharyngeal nerve. And in doing so, it causes this glossopharyngeal <laughs> neuralgia and causes a lot of, of, uh, of that type of pain. And so patients with ehlers danlos don't have a, a long styloid process, but they have that very same Eagle syndrome uh, type pain. So I call that pseudo Eagle syndrome. And if you look in that area right there, there's all these really, really important structures that are passing through this, what I call the Eagle space. Those three nerves, including the glossopharyngeal nerve, um, can be injured there. The vagus nerve, of course, can be compressed and injured there, causing dysautonomia. And then finally, the cranial nerve 11, the spinal accessory nerve, is really important, passing through there. It innervates the trapezius muscle. It's a motor nerve that innervates the trapezius muscle and the, and the uh, sternocleidomastoid muscle. And so all these patients that complain of this intense, intense knotting of their, stern, their uh, trapezius muscles, that's far beyond what you'd expect from what we call the coat hanger pain of, of uh, dysautonomia, starts to be explained. And this is far beyond just a, a poor perfusion uh, of the muscle pain that we talk about with coat hanger pain. This is uh, knotty, tight muscles. And so I think that's explained by the, the uh, spinal accessory nerve having a neuralgia being injured. So this, this portion right here becomes really, really important. And the last structure that's also in that eagle space is the jugular vein. And so Dr. Chopra already mentioned how there's a clearly a venous uh, stenosis that leads to people having high intracranial pressure. And I believe that that's where the major portion of the venous stenosis is occurring with these patients. So the eagle space is bordered by the, in the front, by the back of the mandible, in the rear by the spinal column, medially by the spinal column, and finally, uh, laterally by the styloid process. And the styloid process gives rise to this thing called the, uh, the uh, a high, stylohyoid uh, ligament. So it's really something that wraps around this space and it really com compresses it. And if you think about the issues of Ehlers-Danlos, one is they get a mandibular uh, uh, subluxation. And at night, when they're laying in bed at night, the mandible falls back somewhat. You've already heard about cranial cervical instability where relative to the cranium, the, uh, the uh, spinal column is dislocated and it pushes forward. So the mandible pushing back, the uh, spinal column pushing forward, basically tightens this space, compressing down on the jugular vein, causing potential for increased intracranial pressure, causing the, uh, these three nerves to be compressed. And that I think is the basis for a lot of uh, what we see, the connection between uh, ehlers danlos and dysautonomia. All right, and again, just as an aside, at night you're laying there, uh, your, your tongue, which, you know, the, the musculature is weaker, the tongue falls back, the, uh, uh, you get what's called upper airway resistance syndrome, maybe frank uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, um, obstructive sleep apnea, and then you get the lack of, of uh, blood flow here, 
and you get increased uh, obstruction of CSF flow, and that may lead to nighttime spikes in intracranial pressure. Okay, so in other words, this cranial cervical instability and pseudo eagle space instability uh, leads to a, a way that these uh, five entities can be connected. All right, you get into phase two, the renal hypovolemia phase. And what's happening here is basically blood is pooling in the lower half of the body. The uh, kidneys are in the lower half of the body. They actually think you're fluid overloaded. So your kidneys start to work against you. And uh, that's, uh, they start secreting extra fluid and water and making you even more hypovolemic up in the upper top of your body. And the consequence of that is worsening, worsening orthostatic hypotension, uh, incre increased urinary frequency. And so all those original symptoms just start getting worse. All right, and, and you can see now your blood volume is even further down here, even further away to fill your heart. And so your cardiac output is compromised even more. All right, then you go into phase three, the metabolic dysfunction phase where kind of everything just falls apart for a patient. And if we look at that, something is happening in here that causes mitochondrial dysfunction, the anxiety and depression uh, that we see, increased hypermobility. Now patients are you know, popping ribs out when before they were just showing subtle signs of Ehlers-Danlos, now they're popping everything out. And then you get this whole cycle here of mast cell activation and leaky gut. And if we look at this, uh, this is what I call the brain-gut axis vortex. It begins with the vagus nerve becoming dysfunctional, which then leads to motility problems and gut pH problems, where the pH rises. The, the, the GI tract needs to be acidic, uh, at least in the upper part. Uh, as Dr. Chopra had pointed out, bacteria will sneak up from the lower intestines to the upper intestines and cause what's called SIBO if the GI pH isn't maintained and if there's not a good motility to keep things moving along. He already gave you a little bit of details of SIBO, but one of the issues with small intestinal bacterial overgrowth is they secrete a lot of things that cause mast cells to be activated. So mast cells within the, uh, just under the epithelium of the gut start to activate. They start releasing histamine and something uh, called elastase II, which I think is incredibly important in the development of, of this pentad. Uh, and leaky gut is the result. Leak, uh, bacteria and food particles leak through the gut, activating further mast cell activation, which is releasing histamine and all those cytokines, TNF alpha, and that inflames the afferent portion of the vagus nerve. So you got the leaky gut doing that, and then the afferent portion of the vagus nerve, which is really 80% of the entire vagus nerve. It's much bigger portion than the motor portion. So if it becomes dysfunctional, it's not hard to understand how uh, the afferent becoming dysfunctional is going to lead to the efferent, the motor portion to become dysfunctional. So it's this spiral down where it just gets worse and worse and worse, okay? so. Is this brain gut axis vortex at the center of the connection of these five entities? Okay, and then mast cell activation itself uh, by itself can cause a connection between all five of these entities. And we know that mast cells secrete thousands of different things, and we all focus on hep tryptase because people say to, to diagnose mast cell activation. Uh, you have to have an elevated tryptase. Well, we honestly don't even know what tryptase does. So why does it need to? And why do we think that a mast cell that's been around for eons, uh, earliest part of the immune system, is so unsophisticated that it always releases exactly everything every time it explodes? We think that mast cells are actually much more elegant than that, and they have dysfunctions in different ways. And they probably have personalities that are just as varied as, as human personalities. And they secrete, uh, they secrete things uh, and you know, explode and releasing certain things, and not always tryptase. Heparin's involved, histamine, we all focus on histamine. Most of the therapy is, uh, is uh, directed at histamine blocking, uh, and we don't even pay attention to other things. And I think elastase II, which is secreted by mast cells, is really, really important. Elastase II very specifically cleaves 
uh, proteins, uh, uh, what are called cadherins, calcium dependent adhesion molecules. And these make up the tight junctions uh, of, of the epithelium, for instance, in the GI tract, but uh, they're all over the body. And they also specifically break up and what are called integrins, okay? So these cadherins are everywhere in the body and, and specifically N cadherins are the things that hold sheaths of connective tissue together. And if they break apart, you can understand how this advances uh, hypermobile EDS. E cadherins are in the GI tract. They're broken down by elastase too. Integrins are in the upper layer of the skin. Breaking them down leads to dyshydrotic eczema. Uh, VE cadherins are in the, uh, the capillaries, including the blood-brain barrier. So breaking down VE cadherins by elastase II leads to leaky blood-brain barrier and to other places in the body that depend on capillary integrity. So it leads to angioedema, um, worsening pooling of blood in the lower half of the body. But it also explains a lot of the neuropsychiatric changes we see and a lot of the sensitivity to drugs uh, that don't usually cause problems in other patients. Um, Montelukast, singular, uh, is a, a, a drug that's very problematic in my patient population. It causes uh, depression in maybe one out of a thousand patients that are taking it for allergies, but it causes depression in at least a third of my patients that I put on uh, as, a, as a histamine controlling agent. Uh, Reglan is another one, or uh, I don't know the, the Canadian term for Reglan, uh, meclopramide, metoclopramide. Um, but uh, it causes a lot more extrapyramidal effects in patients when they take it than in the normal population that would be taking Reglan. Okay, and then fi finally is the autoimmunity and structural changes. And uh, again, something here in the middle, maybe it's mast cells, maybe it's something else, maybe it's the methylation folate pathway that I'm gonna mention, if someone gives me enough time here uh, to go over. Yeah, so. This is so important. No one wants to miss this. So, so you got the hypermobility advancing. I already told you why that happens. Uh, but it eventually leads to what's called viscerotosis, sagging of your organs. And uh, the per one particular organ sagging, cerebrotosis, leads to the Chiari. Uh, but you also get CSF leak, the, the CCI, so the, how the ligaments are no longer holding as well in the uh, craniocervical space, uh, and uh, tethered cord can get involved there too. In the, in the rest of the um, body, you've got that MALS, median articulant ligament syndrome, and I think you know, Dr. Chopra mentioned that it may be rare. Uh, I don't think so. I think it's very, very common. I think that uh, a lot of patients that have GI issues, if you press on that one spot in the epigastric region, you're going to find a lot of uh, abdominal tenderness. I think the confusion with mouths is that everyone thinks that it's vascular mouths, that they ought to be able to find a celiac uh, artery that's compressed or gnarled. And all the uh, studies that uh, we do are focused on looking at the celiac vessel. We look, we do ultrasounds of the celiac vessel. We do MRIs, we do CT angios, all looking for the celiac vessel. And I think, you know, MALS needs to be thought of the same way we think of carpal tunnel syndrome, or as Dr. Chopra pointed out, the thoracic outlet syndrome. There are different types. And I think it's the neuro MALS that's the major portion, that it's the compression of this little uh, median arcuate ligament on the celiac plexus that's causing a celiac plexus neuralgia. And it's the celiac artery that's just a bystander, that when it's compressed, that's nice to have because you can actually show that there's a, a problem in that area if the ultrasound's abnormal. But if the ultrasound or MRI or CT are all normal, we shouldn't conclude that MALS is not present. We should conclude, you know what, it's probably just neuromals. I shouldn't say just neuromals. It's, it's probably neuromals that's the problem, and we need to address the celiac plexus. And, you know, patients, if you get a celiac plexus block and suddenly their abdominal pain goes away 
and they, and they start having GI motility again and can go back to eating, that's a huge thing. And they may have completely normal celiac artery. So I think it's a lot bigger thing than we realize. The other thing that sags is just, this is dramatic here, this picture. Uh, this is the a, uh, uh, contrast study of the large bowel, and this is hanging way, way down in the, in the pelvis. That's dramatic, and that's, most patients don't have that much uh, uh, viscerotosis of their, of their bowels, but it stands to highlight the fact that there's a mechanical issue going on in patients where they can't uh, move their food along well just from a mechanical standpoint. And putting them in a zero gravity position when they are going to uh, get ready to eat when they're eating and when they're digesting their food uh, is very, very helpful to, uh, to helping their GI motility. And then down here at this end of things is, you know, first the mast cells got involved with the, uh, the a leaky gut, but eventually B cells get involved and they start secreting antibodies against the bacteria and against the food particles. And the, and the gut becomes an auto antibody generator. And it starts producing antibodies that cross react with a lot of places in the body. And the, they can, it can be, you know, antibodies that attack the midbrain and cause a, a pans pandas type of picture. It can be antibodies that look like Sjogren's antibodies that cause a, uh, thyroid dysfunction, antibodies that look like lupus. It could be antibodies that uh, lead to the diagnosis of antiphospholipid syndrome. So I think that that ties in where the autoimmunity comes from. It's the gut becomes an autoantibody generator. Um, you also see things like uh, you know chemical hypersensitivity taking off from that point. And I have another theory about that as well that I don't have time at all to get into. So. <laughs> So anyway, this unifying theory of the pentad with elastase two, you've got mast cells that are in the connective tissue that can break down n cadherins and lead to increased hypermobility, viscerotosis, cranial cervical instability. So elastase two potentially being at the center of the uh, connection of the pentad. Then there's the methylation folate pathway very complex, but if you look here, all these little red things here are basically symptoms that patients get. And you can see almost every symptom can be explained by disruption of the methylation folate pathway. And I show it a different style here to point some of these things out. Uh, and just real quick, uh, this part up here of the methylation folate pathway connects uh, choline, pantothene, and cysteine to form acetylcholine. We know acetylcholine uh, production is disrupted in dysautonomia, and by giving mestinon, which prevents acetylcholine breakdown, we help with our, our patients. I give choline and pantothene, which are nutrients. I give them in large quantities, and it's just like giving mestinon to these patients. So that explains that. It's connected to the rest of the methylation folate pathway through a substance called betaine. A lot of you may have been told to be on betaine, and it's great to acidify the gut, but it also feeds into the methylation folate pathway, provides choline, and helps uh, restore nutrients in the methylation folate pathway. Uh, over here, uh, the same pathway is where histamine is produced and broken down with uh, histidine carbox decarboxylase and diamine oxidase. If they're dysfunctional, you may uh, increase your mast cell activation. Over here is uh, the methylation uh, and, and sulfonation of proteins and, and DNA, so that affects uh, connective tissue production. Over here is the arginine uh, nitric oxide synthase pathway, so that may explain, being disrupted there, may explain such things as Raynaud's. This portion here explains uh, serotonin and dopamine and norepinephrine production, which is very important in uh, neuropsychiatric health. So it explains uh, depression and mood and anxiety. Uh, over here is the connection with the mitochondria. So you can see how mitochondria might become dysfunctional if methylation folate pathway is dysfunctional. And then over here is this uh, topic of you know, folic acid. We're all told you don't take folic acid, you should take methylfolate. Well, what if you do have folic acid and it's not metabolized well? Well, then it may go down this other pathway of what's called unmetabolized folic acid products. And some have uh, uh, 
link that to uh, a lot of the sensitivities, pain sensitivity, light sensitivity, sound sensitivity that occurs uh, uh, if folic acid is metabolized down an alternative pathway. So is the methylation folate pathway uh, itself a connection uh, to, to the five entities? All right, so there you go. Four different ways that potentially uh, uh, this is all connected. And that's my final slide. Thank you for the extra time.